Welcome back. Today we are going to be discussing protist ecology. As a reminder, ecology is the study of the interactions of organisms and their environment. So in other words, why do we care about protists? How do they affect our ecosystem? How do they affect us as humans? The first thing we need to discuss as we talk about protist ecology is protist habitats. Generally speaking, protists live in damp environments. Right. These damp environments can include things like streams and rivers, lakes and ponds, oceans, swamps and marshes. Decaying matter. They can live in the soil. Soil is definitely moist enough for them. They can live on the surfaces of leaves, especially decaying leaves. And then one of the favorite places for protists to live is in or on a host. All right, other organisms are nice, moist habitats for protists to live inside. All right, so within these habitats, what do protists do? Um, and we'll take first a look at how they are helpful to the environment and first at how they are ecosystem engineers. Now an ecosystem engineer is typically a species that builds the structure of the environment. We are typically familiar with things like trees and corals as our ecosystem engineers, but in our current classification system, um, there are some protist ecosystem engineers. One of those ecosystem engineers is kelp. All right? Kelp is a seaweed that can grow over 50 feet tall. It can create massive forests of kelp that are host to a huge amount of biodiversity. If you've ever seen the movie Finding Dory, you've seen video, well, animated videos of these kelp forests. All right, and this, the reason that kelp can provide so much um, biodiversity is because they provide all of the vertical and horizontal structure for the habitat. All right, so that is one protist ecosystem engineer. Aside from ecosystem engineers, we can also have protist mutualists. Now, before we talk about the examples with protists, we need to talk about what exactly is a mutualism. A mutualism is a close relationship, usually meaning physical contact, between two different species where both species benefit. A classic example of this would be like in Finding Nemo, where we have clownfish living in anemones. All right, the clownfish get a safe place to live. Um, the anemones get to be cleaned, all that great stuff. All right, so what are some of the benefits that come from a mutualism, whether it's the anemones and the clownfish or something else, right? So the species participating in a mutualism can get food or nutrition. They can get habitat or shelter. All right, we don't see this as much with protists, but oftentimes in mammal and bird relationships, we can have cleaning as a benefit. Um, you can also have a benefit for things like transportation. Or, as the clownfish get a bit in the anemones, you can have protection as one of the available benefits. All right, there can be others. These are most of the major ones. All right, so now let's take a look at some specific protist mutualisms. All right, 
One of the most well-known ones is protists in herbivore guts, all right? So for example, termites have protozoans in their guts. All right, remember that termites eat wood. Wood is generally not a very easily digestible substance, and termites actually couldn't do it on their own. The protozoans, or the protists in the termite guts are what actually break down the food. So in this relationship, the termites get their food broken down, and the protists, get both food and habitat. All right, we see a similar similar relationship with cows who have protists living in their guts. Again, in this one, the protists get nutrition um, and habitat, and the term or the cows also are able to digest more of their food. Right, so that's one classic example. Another example of a protist mutualism is a lichen. So a lichen is this green kind of flaky stuff you often see growing on trees and rocks. Lichen is actually a mutualism between an algae living inside a fungus. All right, so in this relationship, the algae can photosynthesize, which provides the fungus with sugar. But remember, this algae, um, a protist can't live on its own, all right? The, well, sorry, let me back up. A protist needs a moist habitat, all right? And the surface of a rock or a tree is not a very moist habitat, but the inside of a fungus is. So the algae gets protection and habitat. Right? And it is this combination, because a lichen brings its own habitat and its own food, that allows lichen to be a pioneer species. When you learn about succession, you learn about pioneer species. They are the first ones to typically settle in an area. Lichen can do that because it can both protect itself and provide its own food. Right? And it doesn't even need soil or anything like that, like a plant would need. So it can settle on bare rock, so that lets it be a pioneer species. All right, our next mutualism, like you probably read about in the textbook, is our sloth with algae. All right, the algae is growing on the sloth's fur. All right, we all know that sloths are slow, and sloths typically live in the canopy of trees. Now, a slow sloth is not going to be much competition for a fast jaguar. So what the sloth gets out of this relationship is it gets camouflage from the green algae. Whereas the algae, which is photosynthetic, gets transportation up to the sunlight so that it can photosynthesize more. Our last example of a protist mutualism is coral with zooxanthellae. So zooxanthellae are algae that live inside of coral polyps. All right, this is our coral polyp right here. And you can see the zooxanthellae, these brownish green dots, which are algae that live inside the coral polyp, right? What these zooxanthellae do, these zooxanthellae photosynthesize and provide the coral with food. Now, coral are able to feed on their own, but the zooxanthellae provide a large majority of their food. And the zooxanthellae get nutrients from the coral's waste, as well as a place to live. All right, now good healthy coral is filled with these zooxanthellae. They're what give it its color and provide lots of food for it. However, when a coral gets stressed, and scientists still aren't entirely sure why, um, a coral will spit out all of its zooxanthellae, okay? Um, this does not mean the coral is dead yet. However, it does mean it's weaker. It's kind of like how you're weaker after throwing up from a stomach bug, all right? Um, the coral now does not have the zooxanthellae inside it anymore to produce the sugar, and it's left to its own devices to find its food, all right? When this happens, when the zooxanthellae are gotten rid of, it is called bleaching. All right, if the coral does not recover from this quickly enough, the coral can die. However, if the coral does recover, does regain its zooxanthellae, it can go back to having a normal, healthy state. 
One of the things that causes this bleaching is um, rising ocean temperatures and high temperatures in the water. And so we're actually seeing mass amounts of bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef over the last few years as we have had the warmest years on record. And so this close mutualism between coral and algae is actually one of the things that keeps our coral reefs healthy and is in danger right now with global warming. Many protists are producers and primary producers, all right? Um, protists are actually one of the largest group of photosynthesizers on the planet. They are the base of the ocean food chain. And they produce 70 to 90 percent of the world's oxygen. Now normally when we think about oxygen we think about trees producing it. However, this number 70 to 90 percent actually makes sense if you think about what covers the surface of the earth. The earth is 75 percent water. Protists live in that water so they're going to make 70, 90, 70 to 90 percent of the world's oxygen. Right? Many protists are also consumers. Things like the amoeba and the paramecium that we saw in class, or the blepharisma, are consumers. They eat these photosynthetic um, protists as well as other bacteria. And then we also have many decomposers that are protists. Right? Things like slime molds help us decompose the matter around us. All right, so then how can protists be harmful? All right, they do often cause plant diseases like downy mildew and powdery mildew, and animal diseases. If anyone's fish has ever gotten these white spots, that is called ick. No, really, it's called ick. Um, and that is a protozoan parasite, okay? Um, protists can also cause human diseases like malaria, sleeping sickness, or Chagas, which are both similar diseases. Giardia, which causes um, intense diarrhea. We also have brain-eating amoebas. This is why you should be careful with neti pots, as well as um, if you are in a freshwater stream or pond, making sure that water doesn't get up your nose. And then also toxoplasmosis, which is transmitted through cat feces and is the reason why we always bag up our cat feces instead of just putting them directly into the trash. All right, um, protists can also cause debt algae blooms, which is when there's a sudden burst or sudden increase in algal growth, usually due to increased nutrients, right? This causes things like dead zones where the oxygen has been used up, and it ends up killing lots of other animals. It can cause red tides where the um, algae are releasing uh, toxins to kill other competitors. And sometimes the algae can even overgrow coral reefs and end up killing the coral. All right, so then how can um, algae actually be beneficial to us? Because it's not all bad and it's not just algae, it's protists in general. One thing that we do is we often use um, protists for food, things like seaweed. We often think of on sushi, but people also eat seaweed salads in other cultures. So we use these protists for food. And we also use things like auger and carrageenan and alginate as thickening agents. And I will post on Verge for you an extra credit assignment to help you discover what kinds of products around your house have these three thickening agents in them. All right. We can also use protists and algae for things like we are trying to figure out how to farm algae for biofuel um, because it is much easier to grow and produces a lot more oil than most corn. We use it in a lot of paints, especially reflective paints. Um, crushed up diatoms, as well as in drug discovery. So that's why protists are important, and that's all we have for protists.